Welcome to Unlikely Intersections, where intent, impact, and inquiry inspire our conversations. I am Dr. Terry Jackson, and he is Dr. Philip Brown, and we are at the intersection. What is interesting is that we all experience intersections on a daily basis. We experience intersections at work, at home, and in church. How we handle those intersections will determine the trajectory of our daily lives. Dr. Brown, it's a pleasure to be with you, my friend, again, to have this important conversation. Yeah, we're going to do what we do today, right? We're going to throw in a topic that's going to have a title that may not make sense at first, but hopefully we'll land a plane at the end of the day, right? We're going to start local and go global. Absolutely. But today's topic is identity theft. And we're going to go back in time. We're going to go way back in time over a century to the identity that was stolen from Wilmington in 1898. Absolutely. You know, <clears throat> Most people think about identity theft and they think about what's happening in the technological age, right? People taking their ID and trying to get credit or using their credit cards. But this is something that is totally different that I was having a conversation with a friend and he tossed this concept at me. I was like, wow, man, this is, this is interesting. I never thought of it that way before, but that's what this is about, right? It's about thinking differently getting different perspectives, different understanding how people think differently. And it makes us all better when we can get those different perspectives and perceptions from other people. So true. So true. It makes me wonder the identity of Wilmington. Mm. So we can, let's start that way and then talk about some individual identity theft as well. But let's ask the question, what's Wilmington known for now? You know, if you ask different people, you're going to get different answers. But if you ask them, just about everybody's going to reference that history of 1898 because it's been in the news is, is so, so, so much. There have been several books written about it. Um, they'll reference 1898. Other people will reference the beaches. Other people will reference uh, Wilmington as a tourist area, uh, a beautiful place to live. Depending on who you are will dictate how you respond. But as you said, what is Wilmington really known for? As a resident and a native there's not one predominant thought about Wilmington that I have that says this is what Wilmington is known for so I don't know right and then there's the Wilmington 10 let's not forget the Wilmington 10 that's right some of my earlier childhood memories were right in the wake of the Wilmington 10 and the basically the integration of schools that was occurring during that time but isn't it fascinating that two native Wilmingtonians are struggling with the identity of our hometown and the town that we now live in? It's amazing. It really, it, it, it really is. Because when I go to other places, I ask the same question. You know, I go to Columbus, Ohio. So what's Columbus really known for, right? You know, speak to me about the food. You know, people might say Wilmington and seafood, right? If I go to Dallas, Texas, I'm like, what is Dallas known for? Talk to me about the food, right? I don't know if there's anything in particular that Wilmington is really known for, and we are struggling with it. Wouldn't it be nice if we could design what we were known for? If we could paint that picture, if we could paint the vision what would Wilmington be known for? What would the Terry Jackson version of that be? Yeah, it would be. Uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a do a takeoff on something we talked about in a in another episode, and that was destination health. So now we're gonna think about destination Wilmington, right? What would Wilmington look like, right? It would be probably a more vibrant city. Uh, from a cultural perspective, 
uh, it would be a city where there would be more opportunity from a commerce perspective, maybe some some larger organization come in that would give the ability for those to be employed, right, and and to in, improve the tax base because we know the tax base has to be increased and improved in order for us to continue to grow. It would be a city where um, I think the demographics now are somewhere around 72% white, maybe 13% African American. Let's bump that up to maybe 20, 25%, right? Um, it would be a city that would be considered, you know, a safe, a safe city, uh, a fair city. Uh, it would be a place where I would want to strongly recommend friends that Wilmington is the place that you really need to be. And here are the reasons, one, two, three, four, five. At that, at the present moment, I can't do that. Right? At least I don't feel I can do that. Others may feel differently. Uh, it would be a city in which I would think that the university would have a vested interest in all communities, right? It would be a city where we were known, we would be known for taking care of our own. Everybody was would be interested in taking care of their own. And from time to time, Wilmington has shown that brilliance. When we think about hurricane seasons and how the hospital galvanizes its strength, you know, in the city, it takes care of its own. But that's only in crisis mode. We need to be able to do that on a normal in normal mode. So that's that's the that's the picture that I would paint that I would love to see of Wilmington. What a great uh, topic about how well we respond to crisis. Mm -hmm. And we're conditioned to it. We know how to get ready for it. We know how to act in the middle of it. And we know how to lift each other up afterwards to a certain point. Mm -hmm. That takes a lot of energy. And you know what happens after is maybe where we get stuck. You know, for me, I would say, you know, Wilmington would be destination health mm. in my perfect view of Wilmington. But that would mean a lot of things, right? Mm -hmm. It wouldn't just mean people didn't need to go see the doctor a lot, mm -hmm. right? It would mean spiritual, mm -hmm. mental, physical, financial, emotional well-being. It would be a cohesive community. It would be a walkable community. It would be vibrant. I mean, we have beautiful weather mm -hmm. 12 months out of the year, mm -hmm. really, with like limited exceptions in every month where, you know, you wouldn't maybe want to get out as much. But the thing is, is it could be a 12-month a year outdoor, people coming together, great place to eat, mm -hmm. healthy food, great education for our kids, mm -hmm. building the next generation of entrepreneurs, tech giants, mm -hmm. educators, mm -hmm. physicians. Mm -hmm. That's what we could be. And it seems like it's within reach. I would agree. When I look at the resources, right, you know, we got the water here. We got I-40 that comes into Wilmington. Uh, so from a trucking or a shipping perspective, there's we can get anything here that we'd like. You know, we may be the smallest county in, in the state, but it is a destination that people want to want to want to come, right? And so why is Wilmington not living up to what it should be? What's impacted its identity in such a way that it's not being the brilliant city that it could be? Well, I think that's where we go back in time. Mm -hmm. And we go back to all the way back to 1898. And we can look at that time, and even though I'm certain it had to be far from perfect, and historical mm -hmm. records would show you that it was far from perfect, and it was not a Shangri-La by any stretch mm -hmm. of the imagination, mm -hmm. but there was a vibrancy that existed then mm -hmm. that has since failed from November 10th, 1898 on. And it was an economy where people had a chance to participate no matter what demographic they were in, right? It was an inclusive economy. 
Mm-hmm. And it was the largest city mm-hmm. in North Carolina. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then that one event put a glass ceiling on our town. Mm-hmm. And we were no longer this inclusive community when it came to opportunities. We were something else. Mm-hmm. And to me, that's the beginning of an identity theft Mm -hmm. that has taken away who we could have been, but only up to now. That's right. right. Because we can still be all those things, and we should. And we have a lot of minds, I think, working on it now. So I still have hope, and I think we still need to honor the heritage that we're not where we could be. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And we need to figure out how to move forward. You know, this whole identity theft uh, concept around, <clears throat> you know, you and I both know people who uh, maybe they gained a nickname while they were growing up. And for whatever reason, they're still trying to live up to and have tried to live up to all of their life that particular nickname. But what that nickname did was it took away from who they were who they were authentically. That nickname tried to get them to live up to the expectations of others versus them living up to their own expectations. You know, I, I remember the advice I gave to my daughter when she she went off to college. I said, don't live up to anybody ex- else's expectation. Don't let them place expectation on you. You determine what it is you want to do and you live, to, live up to your own expectations. So I didn't want her to get out of who she authentically is. <clears throat> not that she won't grow or not that she wouldn't grow, but remember fundamentally and foundationally who you are. And too often people lose who they are and they try to be what others want them to be. And, and that begs the question, who really tells you who you are? Deep, deep subject. Something we spend a lot of time on in leadership, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, that's right. That's like, you know, it all starts with uh, leading oneself. Yes. Uh, and that's something that we we can train into kids uh, so that they have those foundations. Mm-hmm. And obviously one of, the, one of the hallmarks of that is respect. And I think when you start talking about the concept of identity theft and becoming somebody that's more consistent with your nickname than the name you were given. Right. Uh, what you're really talking about is a certain level of self-respect, right? And that self-respect is so critical because it sets you up for how you view every other thing. Yes. Yes. I would agree with that. You know, I can think of plenty of friends. I can look at them. I can contemplate their nickname, and I can see the trajectory of how that nickname helped them, be it good or bad. You know, because sometimes you give someone a nickname that's something that's great, right? And they try to live into it, and all of a sudden you're like, wow, take a look at how this person has grown, right? So it's not necessarily a bad thing, but for the most part, People are really trying to live something that they're not, right? And and that ties into what we talk about from a leadership perspective, that imposter syndrome, right? Because all of us at some point in time have experienced it for whatever reason, right? Uh, but it goes, gets back to self-leadership, self-esteem, self-awareness, and all that's tied into emotional intelligence. And so I wonder sometimes when those people who identity has been stolen because of a, a label that's been placed on them, um, where they are emotionally, that's, uh, it would be interesting to, 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 to find out um, because the question is, you know, what are they really living up to? The label, the curse of the label, or the blessing of the label, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and how that ties in really all the way back 
to 1898 mm -hmm. in this town mm -hmm. and in many others. It may not be the same date, right? Mm -hmm. It might be somewhere else in the country that has their version of 1898. Yep, Tulsa, Oklahoma, Atlanta, Georgia, a lot of southern cities. Right, yeah, I mean, yep, yep. All, and so, you know, well, those things are probably related. Mm -hmm. You know, and so when when we when we have a situation where a label causes somebody to excel, we don't worry about it too much. Right. Right. It's probably a mind trick anyway for them because that really is probably who they were going to be or mm -hmm. who they wanted to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But when those labels result in underperformance or being held back mm -hmm. because of what that means or even oppression, mm -hmm. then I think we have to think about it differently. And at some point, as a community, we need to own the degree to which that happened. And like I've discussed a number of times, you know, I'm a doctor, so I think in medical terminology, right? And I have always scratched my head when I hear people talking about the scar of 1898 in Wilmington. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I mean, I'm a surgeon, so I'm, I'm looking at that thing and I'm saying, that's not a scar. A scar is what happens when a wound heals. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What we're talking about mm -hmm, for mm -hmm. 1898 in Wilmington mm -hmm. is we still have a wound. Mm -hmm. And we see it based on what the opportunities or lack thereof are. You know, and in, in surgical terms, you know, some of the first things you have to do about a wound is is clean it up mm -hmm. right i mean we've mm -hmm. all cut ourselves the first thing we need to do is you know wash all the dirt out of there mm -hmm. right look mm -hmm. and see if there's anything in that wound that's unhealthy get rid of it mm -hmm. so that it can begin to heal and a lot of stuff has to happen in order for that wound to heal most of it you don't see it's behind the scenes it's policy mm -hmm. Right. And mm -hmm. things like that, that you don't really see. And you have to survey what's behind the scenes mm -hmm. to say, is that having a good effect on wound healing or is there something still wrong? Mm -hmm. We have continued to have a lot still wrong. That means we need to do another operation mm -hmm. to clean that up. Mm -hmm. Revisit that policy. Let's think about its effect on the wound because what we're shooting for is a scar. You know, a scar tells you what's happened, but it's still strong at that point. A wound is weak. We really do want to have a scar of 1898. We will always see it. Mm -hmm. I would, in my heart of hearts, we talked about what Wilmington could be. Mm -hmm. I would hope that everybody that's a part of Wilmington would understand 1898, what happened, mm -hmm. right? That it would become a part of the fabric that we would, you know, really just make that a part of who we are and own it, own it for what it was. And, and <laughs> accountability, responsibility. Not that the people living today were responsible for what happened, but understanding that history and who was responsible. And as you said, let's begin the healing process, right? You know, I, I think of a couple of things. I remember, I think it was probably the 1990s, maybe early 2000, the conversation was around an 1898 park to commemorate what happened or a grocery store. The decision was made that it would be the part to commemorate the history of 1898. And I thought to myself, people need to eat every day. So you talk about policy. So they put up a park where you can go and you can stand and take pictures, but no one can eat. And so there's still not a grocery store on the north side. Now, you know, you have uh, Frankie's, which is you know, on uh, over there off of Prince's place, uh, I think 11th and Prince's. However, the park is over off of 3rd Street near the, where the Taylor Homes area. 
And there hasn't been a grocery store in there in many years. I remember when the old A&P was there many, many years ago. Had to be the early 70s. So we're talking about early 70s to uh, 2022 without a grocery store. That meant that those people had to go either out to the Castle Hain area or to Market and seven, North 17th Shopping Center, which was Market and... Kerr Avenue to go to the grocery store, maybe come to the South Side, but there were no grocery stores. There may have been one pharmacy. There was no uh, hardware store on that side of town for a long time. So even though people made policy and they, the intention was good, but to provide a part that gave the memory of what happened versus someone being able to go to a grocery store and go shopping. That's, that's a whole different ball game. Now when we talk about policy, we talk about the resegregation of New Hanover County Schools, where the federal government is saying, how did you guys do this? You have to review this. How did you get there? Policy, right? And that policy is in the same mindset of what occurred in 1898. So when you talk about identity theft, look at what all that was taken away from Wilmington. We know there were great athletes that come out, come out of Wilmington, great scholars that have come out of Wil Wilmington in all communities. But a lot of that identity was stolen, and there probably were many other great scholars and athletes and people who, that could have come out of Wilmington who maybe they didn't want their children to come back here to live because of what happened. So that is a wound that we need to definitely treat. And we have to start where we are. Yes. You know, the thing we talk about all the time, whether it's leadership development, whether it's diversity, equity, and inclusion, whether it's health equity, whether it's getting in shape, whatever it is, right, you can only start where you are. That's right. And we have a lot of positive pieces in place and more – today than we have in quite some time, right? So the piece is in place to put a food co-op in the north side finally. Mm -hmm. You know, that's in the near future, we believe. There's a piece to help provide food access in south side since the IGA burned down several years ago. That's in sight. Mm hmm these are really small pieces, and, 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 and even as I say it, I'm, I'm scratching my head, and I'm thinking, we're just talking about people having something to eat, right? <laughs> just like, that simple. Just being able to go to the store to be able to make it, and we, got, you know, we know that we've got a childhood food insecurity rate of about 20% mm -hmm. in our county. Those are some of the reasons why. Mm -hmm. And... So we should certainly start now to reestablish that identity. I mean, I certainly, I find it unappealing, sad even, to say that I come from a community where 20% of the kids don't have enough to eat on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. Doesn't make any sense. I would have never thought that in, in, in Wilmington, North Carolina, uh, that food security was an issue, would become an issue. I never thought it would happen in the country. But when we look at policy and those people who create policy, you know, I, I, I termed uh, a phrase several years ago, intentional poverty zones. And with that, I began to take a look at certain areas of Wilmington, how they were flourishing or how they were, or how, or how they were not flourishing, and go back and review policy about you know, certain institutions pulling out of certain neighborhoods, certain in inter institutions being in injected into other neighborhoods. You know, you look at the, the pulling out of the grocery stores and the pulling out of the banks, but yet you get the pawn shops, right, at which just exploit people, right? Not that the pawn brokers mean anything, uh, deceitful for the people but you know as an instance what you told me when you took the banks out is that I couldn't save money I couldn't invest money 
but I bring in the pawn shop, I can spend money. I can, I can, I can pawn something and pay these exorbitant, exorbitant uh, uh, interest fees, right? Or uh, payday cash loans, right? Where, you know, I'm gonna give you a check, you're gonna hold it, and, and, and you're gonna give me some cash, and I'm gonna pay you back this exorbitant amount of money given an interest rate. So I was able to do that in my community, but I couldn't save and I couldn't invest, but I could be exploited from the payday cash. I could be exploited by the pawns. I can come in and if I have gold, I can pawn my gold for money, right? And then come back and pay you more than you gave me for it in order to get that back. I can see the 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 corner stores coming in and the selling of the alcohols, the liquors. I can see that happening in my community. Um, but I couldn't see a legitimate grocery store coming in or a bank or a uh, credit union, right, happening somewhere where it could teach financial literacy, right? Uh, desperate people do desperate things. And so desperate people you utilize those types of institutions in the community. And that's given rise to some of Wilmington's identity theft. You're taking away from the humanity of a people to make them feel a particular way, to feel oppressed, to feel subservient, to feel inferior. And so when you create that, at some point in time, that's going to bubble up and there's some kind of resistance to it, right? The resistance might be, you know, one against the other, one group against the other, or it could be internal. And what I'm seeing in that identity theft is that internal uh, inferiority, superiority, for lack of a better explanation, sardines in a can, right? Where one turns against the other, and that's what we're seeing from some of the violence that we're having. You got all of these people together. Uh, most of them are somewhat oppressed, maybe underemployed, undereducated, uh, not knowledgeable, and we've taken their identity of who they could be and we are creating them into something that they probably didn't want to be, but they're in a condition where they could be nothing but what they are at this particular time. It's, it's always been instructive to me to see what happens when folks get out of a situation like you described, right? And in Wilmington, there are lots of different models. So mm -hmm. let's take the model of black physicians. Mm -hmm. There are a number of really smart people, students from Wilmington that went away, mm -hmm. got their undergraduate education, got their medical education, did their training, and never came back. Mm -hmm. And that's true in, in many professions, right? Mm -hmm. it could be medicine, it could be law, it could be business, it could be all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm always moved to, to ask. So in your case, you came back, if I'm not mistaken, not only once, but twice. A couple of times, yes. Despite being highly successful, you still came back. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. why is that? That's interesting. That's an interesting question. The first time I came back, uh, 1993, I think it was. We were living out in Los Angeles, and the family got tired of being 3,000 miles away. So I started to look for other opportunities. And it just so happened that I had the opportunity to come home in pharmaceutical sales. When the guy said, well, this position is in Wilmington, I was like, Wilmington, that's my hometown. I can come back to Wilmington and be a pharmaceutical sales rep. Why not? So it brought the family back to North Carolina, and it enabled me to become a pharmaceutical sales rep. I left Wilmington again somewhere around 2003, 2004, went up to Durham, and then ultimately from Durham to Columbus, Ohio. The second time I came back, it was basically, one, to create a consulting business and to make sure to take care of my mother, because I'm, I'm an only child. <clears throat> However, I mentioned to my daughter that I did not want her to live in Wilmington. I didn't see the vibrancy of the culture that's needed to sustain a particular 
lifestyle. Um, I didn't see the commerce here that would pay someone uh, what they were should be valued at, given their edu- level of education, at least in the African American community. Because you talked about those who you know who've gotten their undergraduate, their medical degree, and decided not to come back to Wilmington. Wilmington is always, and I think the sociologists call it this, Wilmington has always suffered from brain drain in the African-American community. Talented, intelligent people who go get their education, go into the corporate setting or start businesses, but they don't start them in Wilmington. They go elsewhere. And so for me, it was about making sure that my mother was okay. Whereas others, I have friends today who say, well, man, when are you going to leave? When are you going to leave? I said, well, you know, I've done decently in, in, in Wilmington. And, and you know, it, it has to be more f- for me to be a change agent, right, in, 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 in the city. Because at some point in time, it has to. And if I'm here and if I have some of these credentials, then I should be able to help facilitate that process of helping the city become what it should be, right? A city that provides opportunity equally for everyone, a high quality of life for everyone, a great education for everyone, where neighbors can once again know each other because we live in a time where neighbors don't know each other like they used to, right? I think, and, and Wilmington has all the elements of that. It has the water. It has, uh, I think, the infrastructure. For me, the challenge is the culture, which is around mindset, right? How do we change the mindset of Wilmington for it to become what it needs to become? And a lot of it starts with leadership. It starts with leadership. And some of the leadership, um, they can do better. I'll just put it that way. And that really takes us to, you know, another another real question that we have to ask. If we intend to get ourselves into the Wilmington that folks might envision as that truly vibrant place, as a community of belonging, you know, a healthy place to live, whatever you, you want to call it. Who are the key players? Mm. Mm. That's a great question because um, sometimes <clears throat> the job of a leader is to understand that they might not be the one to lead the organization or the city to the next level. They may have a vested interest as leaders currently, but if the city is to go to another level and become that vibrant culture that everyone is looking for, those particular leaders might not be the ones to do it. And so they have to be able to do that self-assessment to understand that I want for Wilmington something bigger than I can actually give Wilmington as a leader. Now, most politicians are not going to do that. Most leaders are not going to do that, right? But we have to be able to find those that are willing to do that because we're now we're talking about the greater good. What are you willing to sacrifice for the greater good of the city? They have to be able to understand that and possibly help identify those that may be able to and then get that development for them, for those who are the ones to take this city to the next level. So it's fascinating because you, you talk about that that leadership and we can go back in time again, right? Like in 1898, it was basically nine people mm-hmm. who changed the course of history. There were some other people involved and things like that. Mm-hmm. But basically nine people who changed the course of history. So you have to think that's probably replicable again with a fairly small group of dedicated individuals don't have to be elected officials, have to have vision, have to step up, have to work together. Mm -hmm. That seems possible. I think it's very possible. 
I think again, Wilmington has all all the elements to be um, a uh, a very influential city in the South and across the country, and it only takes a few, right, who are well connected whose tentacles can touch out and have the ability to influence because that's what leadership is really about and develop that compelling vision that everybody can buy into, right? That's, that's always a key to, to leadership is people enrolling in that compelling vision, right? Being able to d- develop that. And it, it's not compelling if it's not inclusive because it can't be for a few. It has to be for everyone. And it's going to take that kind of mindset to understand that. And everybody doesn't have that kind of mindset. You know, some people, they like to be cliquish and, you know, they like to think that they're doing the right thing. But it's not the right thing by them. It's the right thing by what the city needs. And regardless if it's a political leader or just a leader, right? Because I never considered politicians leaders. They're just politicians. They're looking for the next election that they can get elected right I you know they can help open up some doors but it's really going to take the leaders from the community to make this happen as it should happen and Wilmington does have that potential to do so it's fascinating to me that so often in our in our city we have folks get together well intentioned make a plan raise some money, spend it, and basically accomplish nothing, right? It's like a, almost like a social club. And I think back, I mean, I have to be honest, I've been in plenty of those rooms, right? It goes kind of goes with the territory of the positions I've had. And I, when in my mind's eye, when I think about it, you know, it's like, what's missing? Who's missing? And so often those rooms are missing a lot of the people whose thought processes need to be included in, in, in the deal, right? right? Um, and the misses can go in a lot of different directions, although in our community, quite frankly, we rarely, until recently, are having the having the black perspective having the hispanic perspective represented in a lot of these rooms and so as we're as we're reconstructing our future or i guess really what we're doing is we're drawing it out right Mm -hmm. like we're making the plans the blueprint for the future it's so important to have all the voices but not only to have them in the room but to be able to listen to them and have them be heard. Mm-hmm. That's always been a problem here in Wilmington. You know, you look at the school board now, right? And I think Dorian Cromati is the only African American. That's running, or Veronica. Yeah, they're running, but didn't Dorian, Dorian was voted on last, no, what was that the runoff? The primaries, maybe he won the primary. But when you look at the New Hanover County School Board, the school system that's in, you know, makes policy for all children in the county. I don't think there was one African American. And I'm like, how do you how do how does that happen? Right? You're talking about identity theft. That identity theft happens because the only there's only one group of people, given the demographic makeup of the New Hanover County school system, there's only one group of people I'm concerned with. And that's the white kids. Right, because nobody else is represented, and so I'm discounting everyone else because my mindset is such that, and I live in my in the neighborhoods I live in. Just about everybody around me looks like me, and so as a result, my decisions are based upon the people who look like me around me, and I'm not considering anything else than anyone else, and so that's how these policies of resegregation can happen. You know, would you want to call it neighborhood schools? Right, <laughs> neighborhood schools. We're going to build a neighborhood. We're going to put a school there, and we know that the inner city schools, from a from a tax base perspective, are not getting the same kinds of resources as the neighborhood schools are getting. Right, 
That's intentional, right? <laughs> and so you're talking about all of the theft is, that's taking place from these kids in the, in the city, in, in, in the inner city schools, because they don't have the resources. For all we know, they could be Einsteins, but because of the lack of resources, they don't get the opportunity to develop, right? So we're taking their identity of who they could be as, as human. And then we begin to paint them a particular way. We begin to tell a story about them a particular way. And then all of a sudden, we begin to believe in it. And so all of a sudden, here comes the, the school to prison pipeline because we've stolen their true identity as a human being, and now we're getting ready to paint them as potential prisoners that's going to go into the prison system um, because they're not intelligent. Um, I don't want to use the word inferior, but but they're not as in, and they're not as intelligent as, as our, our children, and so as a result, we don't need to waste our resources on them. We need to put them in other places. Those are the kinds of thought processes I'm sure that's happening, because only thing you're considered con concerned with is people who look like you and people who are in your neighborhood that you're talking to on a day to day basis, right? Without having the foresight to be able to look and say, hey, we're not including everybody's. Everybody's voice is not a part of this decision or this policy that we're getting ready to put in place, right? And so, you know, they're having all kind of chaos at the meetings, uh, <laughs> school board meetings. I, I attended one school board meeting, and at the time I knew the school board attorney. And so as I sat and I observed uh, when they had uh, a break, I walked up to the school board attorney because he and I played football together in high school. And I said, is this what happens at a school board meeting? I said, man, this is a circus. He says, you still came on a better day. I was like, wow. Mm. I said, I'll never come back to a school board meeting because I couldn't handle this. It's amazing what happens here in New Hanover County. Well, and we see it, right? So uh, we've talked on previous episodes about this Healthy Communities North Carolina mm -hmm. dashboard. Mm -hmm found at healthycommunitiesnc.org, and it shows county by county. And for our county, you know, you can look at the big racial disparity in third grade reading level. Well, that's a huge marker of success because what happens after third grade in reading is that transition from learning to read to reading to mm -hmm. learn. Mm -hmm. And so if you're behind at third grade, it's that much harder to catch up. Mm -hmm. But you can also, you talk about a school to prison pipeline, you can also look in that same set of indicators, social and economic factors, and you can look at the uh, differential in school suspension rates. Mm -hmm. And for New Hanover County in the last measurement period, that was eight to one. A black child is eight times more likely than a white child to be suspended, which is twice the state average of four to one which is still a massive disparity, right? And so, and then it plays right on out into incarceration rate. And if we want to really promote health and if we want to have prosperity, we got to think differently and address some of these factors. I know there was a study done, it was by a group of interns at NC State, and they used this, basically this dashboard technology, and they looked at only two factors. They looked at incarceration rate and the rate of uninsured, which is, appears lower in the list. And those are the only two factors that were impacted in this study. Mm -hmm. And remarkably, the result was that the rate of food insecurity was reduced by 70% mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. from those two interventions. So there are levers that get pulled in different ways that, aren't necessarily intuitive, but until you start doing some things differently, mm -hmm. you can't tell. So imagine, you know, really working in the school system to change that third grade reading disparity or change that differential in suspension rates mm -hmm. and plug it in with another of the 21 indicators and watching what happens to all the other indicators. That's the way it has to work. It, you know, I agree with you. I was sitting here listening to you and your response, and I, I thought about a gentleman uh, who 
I guess he moved away from Wilmington a couple of years ago, Mr. Bill Graham. I think I made the introduction, you and Bill. But I know one of the things that Bill was doing because he was big in keeping up with uh, the statistics around the city and, and across, the, across the country, he would always challenge the numbers that came out from the UNCW report year in and year out. What I saw in that was a lot of resistance from the locals as who is this guy to challenge what we're saying about the growth of the economy and where we're headed with Wilmington. They didn't view that well when they should have been asking, well, if he sees this, how can we sit and have a conversation around building or designing what this needs to look like, right? Because even when I attended those kinds of meetings and I looked around the room, it might have been 400 people in the room and y'all may be able to count six African-Americans in the room, mm-hmm. right? And that told me that there, were poli- there was going to be policy made, people were going to have conversations, and what was going to happen in those conversations is policy was going to be made mm-hmm. and the majority of the people were not, didn't have a voice. Wilmington has a tendency to, if you are against the grain, if you are against, if you're, if you're bucking the status quo, it wants to try to suppress you, your thought. Uh, and that's why you don't find a lot of resistance to what is actually happening. In Wilmington, so they take your identity. If you are an outspoken person, um, they take your identity. That identity theft that we, we we've been talking about, and in an effort to try to get you to conform to what's actually happening. I mean, we've had some incidences here where people have accused people of bribes here, <laughs> and so uh, we don't know what the truth is, and hopefully, the truth will come out. But if that happened, I can imagine that it's happened a lot in the past. And this is the time that it just came out because of the situation. That in in itself is identity theft. And that means that there's a lot that needs to be dealt with around identity theft in Wilmington on a day-to-day basis. Because if it happened at that scale, at that, at that level, I'm sure it's happening at the very small levels every day. There's there's something out there that's happening as we're having this 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 podcast, right? That's along those lines, and it may not be to that scale, but we know that it's happening somewhere in some room. And so we have to be able to uh, eradicate that kind of culture and 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 let us live up to be who we are intended to be. That's so that's so right. It, when you have those kind of things at, at that level, it basically really makes you question, is this just business as usual, right? Yeah. Like this is happening all over. This is the way things are done. Mm-hmm. And we can definitely do better, right? And it uh, it flies in the face of arguments we hear a lot of times about meritocracy and all mm-hmm. these kind of things, you know, mm-hmm. another great topic for another time. Mm-hmm. But I wonder, you know, we so we're starting now. We're doing some different things. We've come up with half a dozen areas that could be worked on that could actually begin to get traction. How are we going to know that we're on track? Mm. And how do we, for maybe the first time in our history, do a good job of differentiating intent from impact mm. and really making sure that the impact is at least as positive as the intention. Mm. That's a great question. Uh, Cause what I'm hearing out of all of that is metrics. We gotta be able to measure what we do, right? And oftentimes for whatever reason, it's been difficult in the, the social setting, the nonprofit kind of setting, right? Because people are just, they get the resources, they use them, and they say, we use them all, we need more. Regardless of how they use them, they use them and they need more. But it has to be more than that. 
here is what we use them for. Here's the outcome of the utilization of those resources. And this was consistent with what we said we were going to do versus you gave us $200,000, we use it all. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah, we've seen that play. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, we spent every penny. So now we need 200, 250000 for next year, right? But there's no impact. There's no difference that's made. And we as citizens need to hold organizations accountable. So as you talk about the nine people or the, 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 the small group of people that could lead this, there has to be a combination of some of the 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 more the more socially conscious people from a I'm going to say from a nonprofit side in the mix with those who are from the for profit side, right? Because those mentalities are different. But I think that we can blend the two to create the metrics and still be humane in how we go about it. We just don't want to be, from a business perspective, it shouldn't just be widgets. We're treating people as widgets, right? Because that's a pure business. It's bottom line, I don't care, here's what we're gonna get. I don't care exactly how you feel. We shouldn't do that. We can blend the two. And I think there's a, it's so I don't know if it's called social capital, social, social capitalism or something like that, it's conscious capitalism. But we can do that. Right, we have the ability in Wilmington to do that. There's some intelligent people on both ends, the nonprofit and the for-profit end, right? And then we have to look for different people that's not a part of what the system is currently, because the system is producing what it was designed to produce. So we got to kind of um, take that system, take it apart, put a new system together to include new voices with new perspectives who understand that they want to drive a particular outcome and understand that we may not be able to see that outcome in our lifetime, but we're driving toward that. There, here's a vision of what Destination Wilmington should, you know, should look like. Um, but it's got to include metrics. We got to be able to measure it. I got to know where the $200,000 went, you know. Um, and we can't have strictly politicians leading this charge, right? Uh, business people, you know, business people who understand what it is to, to analyze a profit and loss statement. Yeah, uh, you know, you're looking at, um, at an interesting paradox right now when you, when you talk about business, uh, think about North Carolina, and we're just named the number one state Mm -hmm. in America for business. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's, that's got opportunity written all over it. Down here in our little uh, southeastern corner, we ought to mm -hmm. be able to participate in that to a mm -hmm. great, great gain for the people of the community. And then I've, I, I flip that coin over and I look and in the county health rankings, which go state and county, you know, we are up to number 31 <laughs> that's a mismatch mm -hmm. those two things cannot long coexist because you're you're not going to see those big employers want to come here and stay and have to deal with a workforce that's unhealthy undertrained unreliable and those are all the things that are in the health outcomes dashboard right and so if we want to maintain that level of business prosperity as a state of North Carolina, we got to make some different investments on the health side. And in health, I'm not talking about being sick and going to the hospital. I'm really more talking about, you know, how do we get upstream of many of these factors, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Understand that food is medicine, that housing is health care. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you know, how mm -hmm. well is New Hanover County going to be able to attract new employees when we're number 89 out of 100 counties in North Carolina for severe housing problems, hmm. where are the people going to live? Right? So all these things, while we see great promise, we only get to that promise like everything else through some serious work. That's right. And some tough conversations. That's right. We got to have those and we got to make progress. 
And it's time for serious minds to participate in that. I don't know if I'm one of those serious minds. I believe you are. <laughs> uh, you know, and I've really I enjoyed that. this conversation again today because it's these conversations that can take us somewhere. And I hope that our audience will go out to unlikelyintersections.com and check us out. Go to my LinkedIn profile, Doc Philip Brown, to check me out, things we're talking about in health and for you. You can go to Terry Jackson, PhD, on LinkedIn, and we'd be more than happy to have a conversation with you, respond to whatever questions you may have, and enroll you in this vision of helping Wilmington uh, create an identity that is would make all of us proud. Count me in.